If you would, please go ahead and turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. In the Pew Bible that's in front of you, it is page 868. And as you're turning, I just want to give you a quick reminder of where we've been. Over the last several weeks, we've been walking through uh, Luke 9, and now we're in Luke 10. We've talked about the cost of following Jesus. What does it mean to follow Jesus? And then we've also talked about the mission of Jesus and the fact that Jesus' face was set towards Jerusalem and the mission that he was on involved both his death and his resurrection. And then as we moved into last week, Martin preached on the reality that the mission of Christ should be one that informs our mission. It should be one that informs our values in the way that we live our lives. And he also talked about how you and I, if we're followers of Jesus, we are his ambassadors. We are representatives of Jesus Christ, which means we are involved in the business of witnessing to others. And being involved in that means that we, there's sometimes that we witness to people who reject Christ. And we talked about a little bit about that last week. And this week, the passage that we're in is going to continue with that theme of accepting Christ or rejecting Christ. And we're going to see how Jesus speaks of about five cities. <clears throat> so before we read God's word, let us go to him now in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning to sit at your feet. We want to hear your voice, and we want you to change our lives through the power of your spirit. So speak now, for we, your servants, are listening. <clears throat> this is Luke 10, verses 13 through 16. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. The one who hears you hears me. The one who rejects you rejects me. And the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. So as Dylan and I were raising our, our kids, <clears throat> one of, uh, two of our oldest kids had the uh, opportunity to share a room for several years together. And we all know how fun that is to have two kids share the same room because our first kid was very neat and our second daughter was not neat. And so arguments would happen when they had to go and clean their room. And so my oldest child, being the neat person that she was, decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to divide the room in half. We're going to put a piece of tape down the middle of the room. And you stay on your side and I will stay on my side. You clean your side and I will clean my side. Which really seems like a great idea. But then, when it came ready to get ready for church, when it came time to get ready for church or get ready for school or go anywhere, my second daughter had a really hard time because the closet and the dresser were on the other side. And so she's having to figure out, how am I going to do this without creating a problem with my older sister? And so she can't stand on the tape in the middle of the room without making a decision. She has to say, well, if I stay on this side, on my side, well, I'm not going to get ready for school. I'm going to get in trouble for being late. But if I go on this side, I'm going to get in trouble for coming to her side and messing up her side. So there was a decision that she had to make, and she couldn't stand in the middle. There was no middle ground in this decision. The passage that you and I just read is a passage centered around the theme of judgment. And we know from John 5.22 that judgment has been given over from the Father to the Son. So when we look at this text and we see this, this, 
the reality of there's a decision that has to be made. That decision is, do I accept Christ and trust him as my savior or do I reject him? And there's no middle ground. You can't have your foot in one life and have your foot in the other. You can't stand on that fence. You have to choose. Am I going to live a life of trusting in Christ alone or am I going to live a life where I'm just going to reject him? Because that decision has serious repercussions. That decision, the impact of that decision matters, and it matters in three ways. One is our decision, our decisions lead to real life consequences. Two, that decision matters because our eternal home matters. And that decision matters, lastly, because the decision to accept or reject Jesus is one that is personal. And so when we look at that first, that first number one that's in your notes, our, decision, our decisions lead to real consequences. That decision to accept or reject Jesus leads to real consequences. And you're going to see that in verses 13 and 14. And Jesus says in that text, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. And that word woe actually means alas. And Jesus has used that word throughout the New Testament. He uses it in Matthew 23. We're going to see it later in the book of later in Luke. But he uses it in Matthew 23 when he says, Woe to the Pharisees and the scribes. And he calls them hypocrites. And he calls them blind guides. When Jesus says the word woe, he is meaning condemnation, regret, and sorrow. So why is Jesus actually condemning Chorazin and Bethsaida? Well, so Chorazin and Bethsaida, they are two cities that have experienced both all three, the power and the presence and the message of Jesus Christ. He went there and his miracles were done there. And so these cities, even though they were great commercial cities, these cities had sinned greatly. And we see that in Isaiah 23. We see that in Ezekiel 26, 28. We see that because of their pride and their false worship. And Jesus is saying to Chorazin and Bethsaida, look, woe to you. He's condemning them because, look, the ministry of Christ had been done in these cities. And he says to them, woe to you, because if what was done in you had been done in these other two cities, Tyre and Sidon, he said it will be more bearable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. Because you have experienced the ministry of Christ, and yet you have rejected them. And he said, if they had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented. They would have experienced genuine repentance. And we know that repentance is actually an act of God's grace. It's an act of God's grace where we recognize the severity of our sin in such a way that we turn away from our sin and we turn towards God. There's a theologian by the name of Herman Bavink. And he wrote a book called The Wonderful Works of God. And he says this, Repentance in the New Testament is made up of two words that indicate an inward spiritual change that leads to a change in the direction of one's life. Chorazin and Bethsaida had experienced the gracious works of Christ, but yet Jesus was rejected. Repentance did not happen. But Jesus says it's going to be more, it would be more tolerable in the judgment for Tyre and Sidon because if they had experienced those miracles, if they had seen the power of Jesus Christ on display, they would have repented. They would have had this, this godly sorrow that would have led to genuine repentance, them turning away from their sin and turning towards God. So what is, what is the judgment that Jesus is talking about? Because he said it, it, it will be more bearable or tolerable for Tyre and Sidon. Well, 
what is this judgment? And the reality is, is we could spend weeks on this topic because the judgment and the judgment day are all throughout Scripture. But in 2 Peter verses 3, 9 through 10, Peter says this, The Lord is, slow, is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord, in other words, God's judgment, will come like a thief in the night. And the heavens will pass away, the heavenly bodies will burn up and be dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done will be exposed. Ecclesiastes 12.14 says, God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. In Romans 14.10, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. You see, the judgment is going to come, and the reality is, is there will be one day when you and I will stand before the Lord, and all of our works, everything that we've done, will be exposed or found out by God. So why does this matter to us? Why does it matter to us that these four cities, Chorazin, Bethsaida, Tyre, and Sidon, have rejected Jesus? Because we reject Jesus as well. We have rejected Jesus. There are, there are people who we, we witness to and, and they turn away from Christ. They reject his word. They reject his message. But how do we do that? How do we reject Christ in this day? One of the ways we reject Christ is we, we say with our mouths that we're going to live a life of faith. But we live a life by sight. We live a life in complete dependency, not upon Christ alone, but on our own selves, our self-sufficiency, our own resources. That's one way that we can reject Christ. But there's another way that we can reject Christ. There may be some of you in this room who hear the message of Christ, who know about God's love, and yet you say to him, you know what? I can't do that because there's no way that this God could ever love me because of the sinful life that I have lived, the mistakes that I've I've made, the life that I have been immersed in for however many years. There's no way that God could love me. There's an an amazing book called Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland, and he talks about this. This idea that there's no way that God could love me because of my past. And he goes through a hypothetical conversation with a man. And the conversation is between man and Jesus. And it goes like this. The man says, I've messed up really badly in all kind of ways. And Jesus says, I know. The man says, you know most of it, but there's perversity deep down hidden from everyone. And Jesus says, I know it all. The man says, it's too much for me to bear. Jesus says, not for me. Then the man says, you don't get it. My offenses are not towards others. They are against you. And Jesus says, then I am the one most suited to forgive them. The man goes on, but the more ugliness you discover in me, the sooner you will get fed up with me and leave me. And Jesus says, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. If you have walked away from Jesus or you are walking away from Jesus, you're not coming to him as he says in his word, come to me and I will give you rest. When he invites you into a relationship, if you are one who is saying there's no way that he could love me, there's no way that I can look at my past and he could love, all, he could love me because of what I've done. He says... In John 6, 37, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And the reason why that's so important is because we will stand before the judgment throne of Christ one day. All of our works exposed. And at that time, the decision to accept or reject Christ, that decision will be made.
it will be too late to say, I, to say, I accept you. That decision matters because our decision to accept or reject Christ has real life consequences. But it also matters because our eternal home matters. If you'll look back at verse 15 <clears throat> with me, Jesus mentions another city. He mentions a city called Capernaum. And in this city, this city is the third city in which most of the works, the miracles of God, have occurred. It is the center of Jesus Christ's ministry. It's his headquarters. It is where he grew up. And yet, Capernaum has rejected Christ. Jesus asks an amazing question. He says, Capernaum, will you be exalted or lifted up to heaven? And Jesus responds to his own rhetorical question, you shall be brought down to Hades. Now, the Greek, the Greek language for his response, for you shall be brought down to Hades, one commentator actually says that there's such a strong neg negative connotation to that language that it actually should be read like this. Heaven is not Capernaum's destination. Hades is. And we know from looking at, scrip at Scripture what Hades is. Hades in the Greek means the realm of the dead. And if you go and you look at Luke 16 and you see the account of Lazarus and the rich man, Lazarus is in heaven, the rich man is in Hades, and the description of Hades is described as a place of torrent, of torment and anguish. Torment and anguish. But the other thing that you see in that account is there is separation. There's a chasm between Lazarus and the rich man. There's complete separation from where Lazarus is, which is in heaven, and where the rich man is, which is in Hades. One common objection that we often hear to, to Christianity is how can a God who is love also be a God of judgment? That question is, is gone into much more detail than we will be able to get into today in Tim Keller's book, The Reason for God. But he, he says these things in his book. The, one of the issues with the question of how can God be a God of judgment and a God of love is that our culture actually considers the standard of judgment to be our thoughts, our opinions, and what we think to be true. When in reality, the standard of judgment that God looks to when he talks about the judgment that will come is the word of God. It is not our thoughts. It is not our feelings. It is not what we perceive to be true. And Tim Keller goes on to say that the most fundamental belief in American culture is that moral truth is relative to what each person believes or thinks. Therefore, our culture has no problem with a God of love or a forgiving God, but objects strongly to an idea of a God who punishes people for their sincere beliefs, even if they're wrong. The God that you and I worship, the God of the Bible, is one who has attributes. And these attributes are, are love and wrath, holiness, Justice. These are his attributes. 1 John 4, 8 through 9 says, Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So right there we see that God is love. But the reality is, is those attributes, those, those qualities of his character also involve wrath and holiness. He can't be around sin. And so for him to act contrary to himself would actually make him a liar. He intensely hates sin and rebellion, and yet he judges it, but he also loves us. As I was going through this, uh, this passage, as I was studying this past week, uh, Dylan had asked me, what, um, what are you preaching on? You know, do you have, 
do you, what do you, where are you in the process? What thoughts are you having? And so we talked about it for a little bit, and she had an, a, in just a really great thought based upon a Bible study that she's doing right now. And she said, you know, she goes, one way that, that I look at it is I'm okay with God being a God of love and a God of justice. Because it says all throughout the Bible that God is going to judge people for their sin. It says all throughout the Old Testament. We can see that with the Israelites. We can see that they were punished for their sin. And she said, if God didn't do what he said, how could I trust him to love me? How could I trust a God who doesn't say what he says he will do to actually say, on the other hand, that he loves me? When you, and I, when you and I draw our last breath on this earth, the question that Jesus asks, will you be exalted or lifted up to heaven, or will you go down to Hades, that question is actually the question for you and me. Will you be ushered into the presence of the Almighty when you pass from this earth, or will you go down to Hades? Every one of us will have eternal life. The question is, is where are you going to spend it? Our eternal home matters. The impact of a decision to accept or, re or reject Jesus Christ matters because that decision has real life consequences. Our eternal home is wrapped up in that decision. But the last reason why that acceptance that receiving of Christ or rejecting of Christ matters is because our rejection or acceptance of Christ is personal. And we see that in verse 16. Why is it personal? Now I'm going to walk you through the three things that are on your outline. His message, his person, and his plan. In the first part of verse 16 it says, the one who hears you hears me. What does that mean? Well, it goes, it goes back to the 72 that have been sent out that Martin talked about over the last couple of weeks. It goes back to the disciples, back to those individuals who proclaim the kingdom of God and whose the authority of God has been placed upon them so that when they speak, it is as if Christ is speaking because the authority of God has been placed on them to go. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 8, he's, he's teaching on the importance of holiness versus sexual impurity. And Paul goes on to say that whoever disregards this disregards man, this, not, not man, but God. And that word for disregard means rejects. So what is it that he's saying when you disregard this? What is the this? It is the teaching of of the Bible. It is his word. It is his message to us. When we reject the people who send, who were sent out to proclaim the kingdom of God, that message that they're bringing, we reject the message of the very one that they were sent by. We reject the message of Christ. But he goes on and he says, the one who hears you hears me. The one who rejects you rejects me. We re when we reject Christ, when we make that decision, the, the one that we are rejecting is actually the Son of God. That word me is a personal, possessive pronoun. And it refers to the true Son of God. The one who can free you from your sin, from your shame and your guilt. The one, the only one who is qualified to take the punishment of your sin to restore the relationship between you and the Father. When we reject the person who, who was sent, we reject Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself. But there's one last one, and he says this, the one who rejects me, meaning the Son of God, rejects him who sent me. So you're not just rejecting Jesus, you are rejecting the Father. The one who says, I am the Lord your God. 
the one who created you, the one who knows you, the one who wants that perfect relationship restored with you because you had it or we had it back in Genesis 2. And when we reject that, that the Father, we are rejecting his plan of redemption because it's in Jesus Christ. No one can come to the Father except through me, meaning Jesus. When we reject the Father, we reject the Son. And we reject his perfect design for how we're supposed to live vertically and then horizontally with others. Vertically with our relationship with God. Horizontally with our relationship with others. His message, his person, and his plan are rejected. I want to thank you for allowing Dylan and I to be out last Sunday. We had the opportunity to... um, to be with our oldest daughter and son-in-law as they joined a new church. One of the things that she did was she gave her testimony. And we got to uh, be a part of just being in the congregation, listening to her testimony of how she came to know the Lord. And in her testimony, she said these words. She says, there was a point in my walk with the Lord where my family's faith had become my own. My family's faith had become my own. In other words, it was no longer about what her dad believed or about what her mom believed or her grandmother or her sisters or even her husband. It became about what she realized. God loved her so much that he died for her sin. And it became the thing that she believed to be true, the thing that she began to rely on was him and not herself. It became personal. The decision to accept or reject Jesus Christ is a very personal decision. And it has real life consequences because our eternal home is wrapped up in that decision. And it is one that you and I are called to make because Jesus is asking the question, will you be lifted up to heaven or will you go down to Hades when you pass from this earth? If you don't know the answer to that question, if you can't be 100% assured right now that your answer is I will be lifted up to heaven, then I would love to speak with you and so would Martin. And we ask that you not delay, that you come today and you talk about that question with us because it is a personal question where the the decision has lifelong consequences. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have heard your teaching this morning It has been heavy, but we know that it has been directly from your word. Father, I pray that for all those who question their faith in you or who are unsure about where they will spend eternity, that you would cause them to come this morning and talk, to have a conversation. Be with us now as we leave this place, as we go into this week, and help us, Lord, to be your witnesses to Starkville and the world around us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.